ready to meet the strongest chess player in the world and for many the strongest player in the history of the game. He's going to be taking us on an emotional trip throughout the highlights of his career, holding up for a critical examination some of his most cherished memories, forged in nerve-wracking hours of mental combat behind the board. This won't be a calm, reflective look back. It'll be a collection of the most vivid moments in an undeniably dramatic life. Hopefully, by viewing these events through his own eyes, we'll come to understand who this controversial, larger-than-life man really is, what drives him, and what shaped him. Gary Kimovich Kasparov was born on April 13, 1963, in Baku, in the then Soviet Republic of Azerbaijan. And like other prodigies that seemed destined to become world champion, Kasparov did not appear to choose chess. It seems to have chosen him. The story goes that at the age of five, he suddenly told his parents the answer to a chess problem on a table in front of him, even though he'd never yet been taught the rules of the game. At the age of seven, he was enrolled at a chess class in Baku and made quick progress. Age nine, the famed Botvinnik school sought him out and the tiny boy began elite training. By the age of 12, he was already the junior champion of the mighty USSR, the youngest ever. It was the first step on a journey that would be characterized by almost uninterrupted success. He was to become the youngest ever champion of the Soviet Union and then the youngest ever champion of the world. Garry Kasparov took the chess world by storm. In the course of his career, he would change the way people played and even tear down the way the game was governed. He would make enemies as easily and as gladly as he made headlines. Let's look back to where our journey starts, with Kasparov entering his teenage years. The chess landscape was utterly different in the late 1970s. Then, fashion bowed to the immaculate, safety-first style of reigning titan Anatoly Karpov. The most successful tournament player of all time, his sensible, natural style shunned risk and opening theory often took a back seat to patient maneuvering, practical play, and a very methodical clinical execution. Karpov was the model Soviet citizen, a winner who prized politeness, every mother-in-law's dream. On came Kasparov, raging with a, a frightening black leather metal-studied version of success, riding some new contraption called Glasnost. He made noise, he broke things, he knocked people out of his way. Well, there can never be any doubt that no town could ever be big enough for the both of them. Kasparov's style, brash, energetic, and aggressive, set the standard for the next generation of chess players where risk-taking in the pursuit of a victory would almost become an end in itself. His capacity for hard work and the emergence of this new computer technology would accelerate the development of the game to an unprecedented degree. But in his early years, Kasparov was busy enough building success. He was a top student who spent his free time winning tournaments and setting records. Gary was young when his father died. His mother became the power center of his life. And his sense of family has always been very strong. His personal life would become a remarkable blend of close family ties and whirlwind public commitments. What kind of challenge then did it take to make an impression on him? Well, clearly one needs to get inside his head to learn the story behind the scenes and behind the games. Statistically, few things are harder for a successful junior player to win than junior tournaments. With a string of recent successes and having been promoted to the status of Soviet team member at the European Team Championships, the World Junior Championships can hardly have held much appeal for Kasparov. The only unpleasant memories in a so far blindingly bright career were associated with exactly such trips, jousts against foreign youngsters. Precisely those ingredients help to explain why this event and this bold, brilliant game still hold such a high place in Kasparov's personal collection. The tournament, with so little to gain and so very much to lose, represents facing old fears and exorcising them there for good. Gary notched up his first world title in Dortmund 1980. His opponent in this next game would later go on to win the European Junior Championships that very year in overwhelming style. So now we are summer 980 junior championship and again for me it was very important to win i failed two times 76 77 winning the title under 16 and in 980 i was a clear favorite uh, well, we expected you the year before in fact but you didn't play you yeah but Vinik was always against me playing in uh, swiss tournaments mm -hmm. he had a very strong opinion about uh, 
uh, negative influence of Swiss tournaments, of mm. big opens, for, for uh, the creative growth of a young player. So he was utterly against it, and I guess he didn't speak with me for two or three months, even after I won this tournament. Mm. <laughs> but I knew, you know, I couldn't avoid playing there, and uh, uh, I wanted to be there and to win. So it was quite an interesting event. Uh, I guess uh, Nigel Short won the silver medal. Yeah. Yeah, in this tournament. And it was my first uh, game with him. I played black and it was a draw. But also I was, you know, uh, playing some other grandmasters, some other players that I uh, met in, in, in later tournaments. Um, it was a also crucial game in the tournament. I played uh, young Sweet Ackerson, Ralph Ackerson. Uh, who was virtually unknown at the time, but uh, he was doing very well, and uh, at that time he was just half a point behind me. So that yeah. was a very important game. Became European junior champion the next year, I think. Yeah, yeah. So it was an important game, and uh, I had my favorite opening. You know, it's clean. clean well, you're saying that when you played Brown the previous year, you knew nothing about this opening. Absolutely. <laughs> at that time, I knew much more about the opening, but still, you know, it was not. Explode. That's why there's plenty of room for imagination. So White got a very good position in the opening, and uh, I think I had to pay a bit more attention to uh, stop Black's counterplay in the queen side. Uh, but I played straightforward 95, and after B5, Black got some chances. It's a very nice move because now Did you see Black. Him? I don't remember. I. I <laughs> I have to admit I didn't pay much attention to what's happening in the queen side because I believed the game will be set on, on the king side. So today I would be definitely more cautious because now Black got some chances. Uh, the, uh, Black solved the problem with the queen because normally the queen has you no know, yeah. good scores. Now queen is on b6 and uh, is supporting the counterplay. So bishop is protected on b4 and uh, queen e2 is important to prevent an exchange of this bishop, because again, I believe the bishop on d3 will play a very important role. Eikerson found a way to create a pressure on uh, uh, my pawn on e4. So here, black, white had the choice of taking on e6 and then playing d5, or playing rook f4, and it seems that in, 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 all the, uh, um, uh, in both cases, it had uh, quite a good attacking chances. So I still believe that white White strategy was uh, uh, superior. It's a yeah. strange idea. Knight g4 for White now. Knight takes e4, f6. Something strange. No, yeah. th th there are many ideas. I mean, it's, it's White has a very interesting, you know, attacking uh, configuration. But I played d5. You know, I played d5, pushing hard. And uh, I have to admit that probably I, I uh, underestimated that. Simple after knight g4, he takes takes f6. And then I realized that if I play e5 which is a normal move, bishops is 3, 6, I have a good compensation. Very good. Yeah, very good compensation. Uh, maybe white even better, I don't know. Uh, definitely it's, it's not having serious risk of losing. Mm. But suddenly, you know, my attention was caught by a phenomenal idea, and I spent a lot of time, I don't remember how much time I have to look at these score sheets if, if, if this one is still kept. I, I recall it was 40, 45 minutes, I mean, very long thought. Now you thought? Yes in this position. Ah, e5 is a safe choice, but I found something amazing. I couldn't believe my eyes, and I made long calculations, and I thought I found the line that leads to a draw. Eventually, it was refuted later on with a computer. Uh, yeah, not, not, in, not in 1980. You know, in I found a refutation. Now, black was better. Black probably was even winning. But I found a refutation in 98. You know, when I decided to check some of my combinations with the computer. In 1980 and 1981, when we analyzed without the computer, uh, nobody could find a very clear way of winning for black. So I took on f6. So it's, um, it's definitely against all the rules. Bishop takes the pawn. So what do we get in exchange? In Nothing. Exchange, uh, not, not even one pawn. <laughs> yes, but I, I think in exchange we get a very strong constraint of our pieces. And when I say pieces, and we come to the same subject of pawn's role. Uh, in the attacking construction. So, we suddenly got two pawns and, of course, queen, rook, and bishop attacking. So, that's the question whether black will be able to bring its pieces back to defend the king. Um, but I don't think that uh, one could 
underestimate the potential threats because next move, white pawn goes on f6. And the best defense for black was to play rook f7, f6, rook c, f8. After rook f3, I thought that bishop c8, queen g5, I had a very strong attacking uh, uh, chances, but queen a7, rook f1, and probably queen c7, uh, or even g6 instead of queen c7. And uh, white attack wouldn't uh, go too far. But it's, it's much easier to be so confident and uh, quiet when you have a computer and uh, the, the clock is not ticking yes. next to you. So Akerson had to solve new problems and for him bishop takes f6 was a shock. So he could not calculate. Well, he must have realized you were thinking about something. Before. Yeah, <laughs> so but not about bishop takes f6. <laughs> So he was shocked, and uh, the game was over very quickly because he made a mistake, rook h6, uh, which nearly decides a mistake, so he could go to an end game where he had maybe some chances. Because now white's pawns are unstoppable, f6, rook c7, e6. So you see that the, these two pawns are advancing, mm -hmm. and I think you have, to, you have to count these pawns as the major attacking pieces. They're very close, you know, to be promoted. <laughs> and also play a very important role with the attack. E7 is a threat, and F7 is a threat, depending on, 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 on Black's move. So he played Queen D8, but if he played Queen F8, then suddenly I play F7, Rook takes before, before Queen D4, yeah, nice. and now we see what these pawns are doing on E6 and F7. So uh, he's, he played Queen D8, trying to reduce the threats by giving up a Rook. So, for a moment, it seems that black is, 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 is okay. It has bishop and two pawns for a rook, and uh, bishop on d4 is protected. e1 square is covered. That's very important. But uh, the rook could uh, use other open files. And after rook c1, white created this threat, rook ca check. So attack continues. And here, the only defense was to play queen e6, but it led to the end game. That probably won. So it's a very nice pin in the end game. So Akerson tried to, uh, to keep the queens, but white, white threats are coming from all over the place. So he was in, 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 in a terrible time trouble. He played here queen d8, uh, uh, and it, it, it's lost immediately. So the better chance was to play a king h8, but still rook c7, rook h2, king g1. It's a nice win, rook h6, queen f7 and rook f5, so the game is over, so white is totally dominating the field. In fact, the bishop is, you know, on b7 is, is being lost. So after queen b8, the game ended sooner. So I liked this game quite a lot because uh, it was a very unusual concept. And, uh, it seems uh, as though Okerson was actually playing very well. <laughs> oh, he played very well in this tournament. Uh, even after losing this game, I think he won a couple of games in a row. He was very close to me, but then he lost a game to Nigel, where he was uh, uh, winning. Oh, it's an so, insane game, I think. Yeah, yes, it's, it's, it was a very interesting game. So he played a very good tournament, um, and uh, that's why, you know, I think the game was important not only you know, uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, save my leadership in the tournament, my leading position, but also, you know, I played, I played against a player who um, had quite a good uh, tournament by himself. Today, does Kaspar play bishop f6 or e5? Depends on the status of the competition, ah. most likely e5. <laughs> yeah. But this reputation was amazing. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, so I will the, way, consider, the, way, the way Black activated all his pieces, both rooks on the f-file, the bishop to c8, important defense. Yeah, but Even then I will, I will definitely good. consider bishop takes f6 because uh, from my calculation, why did not sacrifice the material? It increased its material advantage on the key side of the board. Mm -hmm. So if you see the black extra pieces are on, 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 on the queen side, mm -hmm. so for a moment I do not consider this as the extra material. So by take on f6, I created two pass pawns, mm -hmm. and I had more pieces and you know very active pieces on the king side. So that's why, you know, in my personal mathematics, 
I increased my material advantage. It is perhaps impossible for an outsider to imagine the kind of pressure on players fighting to get to and stay at the top of the old Soviet chess pyramid. The competition was absolutely unparalleled and the stakes immense. If you didn't produce, there was a long line of people behind, ready and eager to trample on you en route to taking your place to travel in Western currency and prestige. That was on one side, a sudden descent and perhaps disappearance to rural or polar obscurity was on the other. What's it like to be 17, not yet officially titled, and representing the Soviet machine in a chess Olympiad? The combination of pride and terror must make a very memorable cocktail indeed. Team events reward stability, and the last thing you want to see is one of the boys suddenly catching fire and going up in a bang and a puff of smoke, not what his fellow competitors want. With all of these factors to consider, Kasparov's nonchalant attitude to material is all the more impressive, and the end result is soon to be patented tactical bludgeoning.